Well, good morning, church. It's good to have you here this morning. And this is really our first try at being online and doing a sermon online. And uh, I must say, it's very weird uh, talking to an empty building, but we know you are sitting out there listening to that. So welcome to the service today. Um, we are really privileged to be able to share the gospel of Christ through this medium in this crisis that we find ourselves in. And again, as we've said on our website and through our postings, we'll keep you up to date of what is happening as our elders and leaders continually meet and we wait upon the government to give us some instruction on what to do next. Uh, we just want to remind you that um, the announcements will be coming up on the loop now. And uh, also today, our guest preacher is Aidan Friedman. Many of you know him. He's preached here before. And I think he's also got some exciting news about uh, a book launch. But um, I'll leave that up to him. Uh, so why don't you just sit back and enjoy the message that he has for us uh, during this time. And uh, then we continue also reminding you to, um, now that we cannot take up collection, those who can continue to do through EFT, please do so. And those who would be willing to uh, uh, drop off their, their collections for the month or whatever at the office, you are very welcome to do so. God bless you as you listen to the message today. Um, and uh, please pray for us as the uh, Word of God goes out in this form and media. Thank you. Hi church, we are no longer having services at the church. We have gone online. So please let friends and family know who might not be on Facebook or on our database, but do attend our church. The church office is on lockdown, and if you wish to see a pastor or come into the office, you need to phone first to get permission. This is for your protection as well as ours. Please note that all upcoming events are cancelled. These include Champions Outreach, Alpha and any non-essential meetings. We ask you please to all continue to pray for our country, our community and our church. Hey everyone, um, as you know, I'm Aidan Friedman and uh, I'm here today to do something for the very first time. I too have never spoken in front of just a camera and usually I enjoy feeding off a, a crowd who's engaging in the message. So at home today, if you can be cheering me on, but a couple of days later, that'll be great as well. But uh, before we get into that message, I've got very exciting news because two years ago, I stood in this very church and God had unctioned me to tell you all about a very special project that I was going to put my hands to. That project, as you know, is a cookbook that's called My Yiddish Mama. And uh, after two years and visiting many families and listening to many stories and Kristen cooking up delicious recipes and taking wonderful photos, I'm proud to announce that my Yiddish Mama is finally ready. And it is such with joy and excitement that we say this project has literally been everything we've been doing for the last two years. We've managed to love people, serve people and create something really quite beautiful. So if you want to buy the cookbook that was launched in your church, what, we sh what you should do is get in touch with Greg or with Kristen or with me. And in doing that, we will make sure you get one of these cookbooks. Don't miss out on this because it's also a great gift that you can give to somebody as a present. Just to give you an example, we all went to Israel in September. And one of the things that we did was we captured what market life is in Israel. And we spent a Shabbat there and we went around the market collecting ingredients and then we made beautiful food, we met beautiful people and we had a beautiful experience. If you want to experience that, then get yourself my Yiddish Mama. I want to thank you to everybody that was praying uh, through that project and people that were also contributing to that project. A huge thank you obviously to the Patu family who came alongside me and uh, sacrificed two years of their life to have this project made which is very, very exciting indeed. 
And when thinking about the time that we're in and this coronavirus, COVID-19, you have to ask yourself, is it business as usual? So when thinking about what message I was going to bring to you today, I initially was thinking I should do a message on prayer because surely we should be praying at this really crazy time. But as I thought about it more, the Lord is really pressing on my heart that what I should be sharing this Sunday is rather all about loving your neighbor. And I think while this COVID-19 virus is infecting the whole world, we must not forget that actually a greater virus exists. And that virus is called the Adam-01 garden virus. And the whole world contracted this virus. And while the current virus we're facing may have been started because somebody ate a bat, the virus I'm talking about started because someone listened to a snake. And in that garden, as that virus came upon the first two people that lived, it doesn't matter if you touched them, if you sanitized your hands, or if you showered 15 times a day. When you are born, you are born with this virus. But God loves us so much that, brothers and sisters, we can rejoice because He sent us the remedy for that virus when He sent us Jesus of Nazareth. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. There is so much in that passage, so much more than just the conventional way in which we think we ought to love other people. I want to go through a few of these because I think they're pertinent to the body of Messiah right now and how we should be behaving in such a crazy time. I love that it starts with saying, leave a portion of your harvest for the poor and for the sojourner. I think it's such a tremendous gift to be a Christian and to be part of a body that really is a giving and not a taking body. I think it's important for us to know that right from the offset, God wanted us to leave the abundance and the extra for other people. Are we not a community of the children of God whose purpose in this world is to be like Him, to be generous and to make sure that those that don't have, have because we work hard and we have. I love that it talks about not dealing falsely with one another. And one of my favorites is when it talks about unweighty measures, holding on to somebody's wage through the night that you should have paid them. At this time of the coronavirus, as Christians, as the body of Messiah, it is our job to make sure that we do not withhold right now. In fact, quite the opposite. The entire world is going to suffer economically from this virus. We need to find ways that not only do we give generously, but do not hold back the wages from the laborers. If you've got somebody that's working for you, that you don't want to work for you because you're scared of the social interaction, try and consider still paying them, keeping their job going making certain that they've still got money coming into their world so they can be a blessing unto others. Maybe you usually order something from someone and now you're saying, well, I don't want to do this, I don't want to do that. Rather, still try to find a way that you can support that person. Don't withhold wages from people. I've often get told in the circles that we mix in, that this is an abomination to God, and this is an abomination to God, and look at the body of Christ and how unhealthy it's looking. Guess what? Leviticus also says that people that deal in unweighty measures is also an abomination in God's eyes. Did you know that when we don't generously give what people deserve, then actually we are withholding the blessing that God wants to bestow upon them too. Part of loving your neighbor is giving generously and is giving the laborers what they've earned. It says, don't lie to one another. Now you would turn around and say, Aiden, I don't lie to people. Well, maybe you don't. But sometimes what we do, because we have natures to be more of a politician than we do to be honest body of Christ members, what we sometimes do, someone will say, 
do you think it's appropriate if I do X, Y, and Z and to keep the peace, you'll be like, it's okay, don't worry about it. Meantime, you start fasting and praying for that friend of yours. You're lying to that person. Loving your neighbor means being honest with them, being truthful with them, no matter how hard it is to do so. Part of loving one's neighbor is the ability to say, I I know you're struggling with this. I want to pray for you. I want to help you, but be honest about it. Let's not be politicians. Let's be disciples of Jesus. It talks about putting stumbling blocks for the blind. That's another way to love our neighbor. Are we being people and children of God that are able to come into this world, bless them, give them ideas, become creative, become generous, instead of, in our religious thinking, putting stumbling blocks before people? Are we going to those who are blind, the unbelievers, and perhaps not serving them in the way that they need to be served so that they can meet God? Are we putting stumbling blocks blocks before people? We need to ask this question. Right now, as we are, I'm in Cape Town, but those that are in Johannesburg, Durban, and all over South Africa, look around you. Look at the suburbs that you live in. How can you become a blessing to the people that you live around? I know that we can't enter into each other's homes and uh, give each other high fives, but maybe if you're doing a grocery shop, you can go to the grocery store and shop for other people that are maybe elderly in your street, and you can just drop their shopping outside their gate with a little sanitizer. They can pick it up so that they don't have to go out. Just find ways that we can serve people during this time. I love when it says, do not take vengeance. How many of us take vengeance on our brothers, on our neighbors? When somebody hurts us, our natural human instinct is to defend and maybe hurt back. Pay special attention to this time where everything is more tender, everything is a little more serious, and we need to exercise far more grace than we ever have before. We need to be super careful with how we deal with one another, and we need to be forgiving rather than vengeful. These are ways we can love our neighbor. But how do we get there? We're all works in progress. How do we get to a place where we can really love our neighbor in this number of many ways, according to Leviticus? I think the clue, the key stands in what Jesus says. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. And I've thought about this for some months now. And I'm pretty convinced that not enough Christians actually love themselves. And I don't mean this in an arrogant way. I don't mean you should be obsessed and adore yourself. I mean loving yourself in respect to knowing that you are washed by the blood of the Lamb and you are righteous because of the deeds of Yeshua the Messiah. And in that, in God's eyes, you are His beloved Son in whom He's well pleased. Do we love ourselves? Have we forgiven ourselves? Are we able to get over ourselves so that we can spend more time thinking about others? It was going to Canada last year to a program in Vancouver where I was really faced with the reality of this question, Aidan, do you love yourself? Have you forgiven yourself? And I was forced to think about it in such a dramatic way that it brought me to tears most days. But eventually I got to the point when I saw how much God loves me. And in turn, that has helped me process my past and my future and has helped me to try and get better at loving other people when I can spend less time thinking about myself. I know that this is a common thing for us to do, But so often we look at other people's lives and we say, well, I wish I could cook like that person, or I wish I could dress like that person, or have a job like that person, or speak like that person. Ultimately, how much of our lives or time in our lives do we spend wishing we were other people? That is not okay. Let me tell you all, brothers and sisters, God has never been surprised by any person that's been born. He has made us all perfectly, Selem Elohim, in His image. And in making us, 
He knows every hair on our heads. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. He is the creator of the universe. Ephesians says we are predestined into adoption by God the Father. And in that, we have to know that God knows everything. And He's made everything. And the way He's made you, brother and sister, is perfect. Exactly the way He needed you to be made. I don't want you saying, I wish I could be more like that person. Because in a way, that's kind of saying, God, did you make a mistake with me? How come you got that person so perfect? We need to be a little bit more real with what God's word really means and know that the way we are made is the way God needed us to be made. And I'm full of jokes and I'm an extrovert and I'm all these things that my wife is not. She's an introvert. I like crowds. She likes home. I like talking to people that I've never met before. She likes to surround herself with people that she's comfortable with. We're both uniquely different people, but guess what? When we come together, we make a mighty force in marriage, and we love each other's strengths, and we love each other's weaknesses because we help each other in those. I want you to stop looking at other people and saying, I want to be like them. I want you to look in the mirror and say, how can, who has God, how, how can I take what God has made, me, and use that to help others? because every hair on your head he has placed there. Your creativity or your wisdom or your academia or the, whatever way God's made you, he can use that in the kingdom. And I believe he's made you so that he can use that in the kingdom. You have to ask yourself, why was I made the way I was made? And a project that I looked at for the last few months is a project called Shape, where you look at, as a believer, your spiritual gifts, your heart, your abilities, your personalities, and your experience. It comes to the word shape. And in this exercise, I believe if you spend enough time on it, you can actually start discovering things about yourself that you may not have known. For example, in your shape, your spiritual gifts, what spiritual gift has God given you? What has He given you that is unique to you, that He can have you use in the body to bless and serve other people? What's in your heart? What do you love to do? What passions, activities, and interests do you have in your heart that exist there, that make you you? I believe if you start putting your spiritual gifts and the things that exist in your heart together, you start to form more of a complete picture of who you are. And in that, God can use you to really be a blessing. What about your abilities? Each of us have got different abilities. While I may be okay with speaking in front of a crowd, I'm not the greatest writer. And yes, I've just written a cookbook, but guess what? I had so much help by creative people that could help me put my pen on paper. So we all have different abilities. Some of us are great photographers. You should be taking photos. Some of us are great writers. Don't stop writing. Some of us love to encourage people. Spend your days asking God to help you encourage more people. Personalities. Well, we've all got different personalities. And uh, I've taken a few personality tests in the past, and they've all come out with a resounding extrovert. So I know what I'm like. I've got to use that as an ingredient in a meal that we can serve to the body of Christ. Because each of us are an ingredient. Extrovert, introvert, peacemakers, uh, guys who are generous, guys who've got the gift of giving, all those things need to be put into a pile and make the meal that we can call one day the bride that we can serve the body of the Messiah. So I'm asking you today to start taking notes of your shape. What about your experiences? For those of you who know me well, you know that part of my experiences is that I've smoked, I've drank, I've done drugs, I've been very religious, I've been very naughty, and I've pretty much broken all the rules. That's part of my experiences. I've also been in the food industry. Now I've written a cookbook. So as you can see, there's a certain set of experiences that Aiden has gone through, that I've gone through, that God wants to use to reach people. What are the experiences that you've been through? What about the current experience of going through this COVID-19 world crisis? 
all these experiences are there, are ingredients in another meal that God wants to use to serve and feed other people. If I didn't do drugs or smoke cigarettes or drink alcohol, I wouldn't know how to minister to people who are battling with addiction. If I didn't come from a severe religious background, I wouldn't know how to help people get over religious thinking. If I didn't have a great story to tell, then people wouldn't be compelled to hear how a sinner like me got saved by our Messiah. And I bet you, each of you have experiences too. Incredible experiences. I don't want you to be ashamed of those experiences anymore. Do you think it took God by surprise when you acted or did something in a certain way? Absolutely not. He knows all things, and I bet He knew that you were going to get up to that one thing you're quite ashamed of. But Jesus offers us something quite spectacular. He says that if you look to the cross at Calvary and you accept the fact that my blood can wash your sins away, the fact that he was raised to life three days after he died, confirmation that he is who he says he is, and he offers us, like I said earlier, the remedy to our virus, which was sin, which was our experiences, which might come full of shame. Romans doesn't play with its words when it says, do not be ashamed of the gospel, because God does not want us living in shame. He wants us to live unashamed, like the woman at the well, so ashamed, meets Jesus, becomes unashamed, and becomes an evangelist. God wants us to look at our shape, to take note of these spiritual gifts, our heart, our abilities, personality, and experience. He wants us to write it all down. He wants us to get, our, to, get to know ourselves much better. Why? So that we can then hear, as he says, I've made you you, I've made you perfect, I made you in your shape. Now go take that shape and go and bless the world with my love. This brings me to this time of Passover that we're about to have in a couple of weeks' time. And talking about shape and past and experiences and God coming into our world and, and shaking us up and saving us and moving us out, no better festival to talk about than Passover, right? Where we are taken as slaves, as captives in Egypt. Now, some of you might say, well, we've gone back to Egypt because we're slaves and captives to our isolated homes. We can't leave our homes. God's mission is always to set us free. That's always what He wants to do. And I want to run a thought by you all today. Because when the Israelites were slaves in Egypt, God brought plagues upon the Egyptians, and the final plague, the death of the firstborn, which was the most severe in my opinion, God sent a rescue mission for the Israelites. He said, if you take the blood of a perfect lamb and you dip that, the hyssop branch in the blood of that lamb and mark it to the doorpost of your house, when I send out the destroyer, the angel of death, if it sees the blood in your doorpost, it must pass over that house. That house does not see death, but rather gets a promise of life. Have we thought about it from this perspective, though, that God didn't say to the destroyer or to the angel of death, oh, please go knock on every door that belongs to an Israelite and go inside and ask them to prepare a CV. Listen to all the bad stuff they've done. I want you to write it down and grade it out of 10. And if they're just too much of a bad dude, I want you to wipe out their firstborn. Is that what God did? We all know the answer to that. No, He didn't. God was not interested in who was in the house. What He was interested in is the obedience of putting the blood of the Lamb on their doorposts. The angel of death was given specific instructions. Look for the blood. No need to interview the people. And so our shape, our way that we have been uniquely made, the experience in the past that we've had, God is not interested in who we were, who we are, as much as He's interested in who we can become. And it all starts by applying the same blood of the perfect Lamb of God. When Jesus was walking towards John the Baptist, He cried out, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Our job 
is to take the blood of that lamb, the blood of Jesus, and mark it on the doorposts of our hearts. And in doing so, watch as death has to pass over us. What I mean by that is not that none of us will die, but rather that when we die, we are promised an eternal life. We are not slaves to death or to this world, but rather we are promised an eternity with God, a promised land where we are showered with His manna and His blessings like the Israelites were when they were in the desert. It brings me to my final passage, and I want to end with this. Romans chapter 8, 31 to 39, because I'm reading this from the message. And I like what Eugene Peterson does here. I really enjoy the way that he's taken Romans 8 and he's given it his his own slant. I want to read this to you, and this is my final encouragement. So what do you think? With God on our side like this, how can we lose? If God didn't hesitate to put everything on the line for us, embracing our condition and exposing himself to the worst by sending his own son, is there anything else he wouldn't gladly and freely do for us? And who would dare tangle with God by messing with one of God's chosen? Who would dare even point a finger? The one who died for us, who was raised to life for us, is in the presence of God at this very moment, sticking up for us. Do you think anyone is going to be able to drive a wedge between us and Christ's love for us? There is no way. Not trouble, not hard times, not hatred, not hunger, not homelessness, not bullying threats, not backstabbing, not COVID-19. That's my words, but I'm adding them in there. Not even COVID-19. Not even the worst sins listed in Scripture. Can you see that it takes a great deal for God to turn His back on you? In fact, it's virtually impossible. He is chasing you down with His love, and He is trying to get you to connect with Him. What He's saying to believers here is, I love you so much, you aren't even aware of the depth of my love. Nothing can separate my love for you and separate you from me in my love. I want to encourage you all today. God loves you guys. He's crazy about you. He sent his only son to die on the cross for you. He is so in love with you that he literally sacrificed the most important thing to him so we could have eternal life. He knows everything you've ever done. He knows every experience we've ever had. And he still cheers us on. Come on, stick close to me. Stand by me. Walk with me. Let me guide you. Let my spirit show you and direct you. And you can have a wholesome, great life and be servants to my world, to the people in this world. I think it's time that we just say, okay, Lord, I accept it. I accept that you love me. I accept that you made me the way that I am. I accept my shape that you have given me. And in doing so, I believe we can unlock the door to then loving our neighbors. The moment we get over ourselves, we can start thinking about other people. And at this time when it's all very personal and all about us, let's think of creative ways that we can reach our community, creative ways that we can reach the unloved, the people that don't have the things that we have. Let's ask God for wisdom so that we can be really effective in this very chaotic and dark time. So Somerset West Baptist Church, after listening to this, I want you to all think how you can be a light and servants to your community. How can you love and how can you serve, knowing that God goes with you when you do these things, that He's always before you, always behind you, always surrounds you. I want you to know that He loves you, and I want to pray for this church, and I want to pray that you all have a great day, but just be mindful that we need to be responsible too, so sanitize, wash hands, greet like this, Don't shake hands. Rather, if you must be touched by anyone, be touched by the love of the Lord. I want to pray for you now.
Yevarechacha Adonai veYishmarecha, Yeer Adonai Panavelecha veYichunecha, Yisa Adonai Panavelecha veYasemlecha. Shalom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause His face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you, and may He bring you peace through the Prince of Peace, Yeshua, Jesus, our Messiah. In His name, Amen. Have a wonderful day. Shalom. Well, church, thank you so much. Um, thank you to Aidan for just sharing a very, very timely word for us uh, today. And I uh, pray that as you go out and um, just be spending time with your family, that you would take heed to the word that the Lord had spoken to us today. Um, if you are able to help us in any way, where we do need folk now and again to perhaps go shopping for the elderly or for those who have um, put themselves into uh, quarantine, won't you just phone the office and uh, give your name? We'd really appreciate that. As Aidan has said, it's time for us as a community now to draw together, to rely on each other, just like the church did when it began in the book of Acts and what we read about. So thank you, Aidan, for being here. And if you are interested in, in that beautiful cookery book, uh, please contact us and we can get a hold of Aiden for you. God bless you.